Okay, hello, <coughs> hello everyone. I'm, ex um, I'm sorry, but my voice is a bit uh, rough today, so excuse me. Um, so I'm going to talk about the belt who conditions database, and uh, we'll give you an overview over both sides of uh, condition service. So this is a central service, so we have a server side and a client side. And for our system, they're most, almost strictly separated. I will give you an overview of both of them. And then we have detailed posters today for both systems separately, which you can look later today. Uh, so uh, the Bell2 conditions database is uh, meant for a Bell2 experiment, which some of you might not know so much. So it's in Japan. Uh, it's an upgrade of Bell1, which so far has collected one inverse autobahn of BB bar pairs. And starting next year, we will try to get a factor of 50 more of those so that we can, in total, then about 50 billion BB bar uh, events, uh, which we can analyze to do high statistics challenge of the standard model. Uh, mainly B, but also charm and tau physics can be done there. Uh, what do I mean when I say condition data? So condition data is everything that changes over time, like the beam spot position or the luminosity, but it's not strictly spot, uh, part of the event, so it changes over uh, longer time frames, and it's not, strictly speaking, once per event. So example calibration, so even reconstruction settings, which could uh, change uh, with the evolution of the experiment. And the challenges for this are that some of them will be required for data taking, of them, but uh, some we already need when we do the data taking. Uh, others will be required for worldwide uh, grid cloud processing, maybe even for the last step of the analysis on the user laptop. And there are different requirements by different subdetectors. So we have, uh, of course, different uh, detector uh, experts which uh, have different calibration constants. So everybody has his own idea and time development scale. Some will evolve very rapidly, some will evolve very slowly, so all of these has to be considered. And there will be a few terms I'll be using, so uh, payload, uh, we call one atom of calibration data, for example, like the alignment constants. Those usually have a interval of validity, short in IOV, this is the time for which they are valid. And then we put all these together, so a set of uh, payloads and their corresponding IOVs in the so-called global tag. So if you look at the picture, the global tag is the whole list of which payloads we have and in which time uh, slice they are valid. And you could have open IOVs, so they can say they're from here to infinity, but you could also have closed IOVs and say, for this region I don't have a certain payload because it just doesn't exist. If there is no pixel detector active for this time, maybe we will not have calibration. So this is the general structure <coughs> and how we decided to implement this uh, for Bell 2 is that we decided to do not or to not develop any code if it's not really, really necessary. So to use industry standard tools wherever that's possible and to decouple the metadata from the content so to make this as separate as possible. And the decision was to use a REST service for the metadata, which as uh, most of you probably well know from how the internet works nowadays, and use plain files for the payloads so each payload is basically just one file with a certain content, and then we have a REST service where you can discover which files you need. And the smallest granularity which the metadata should be concerned for Bell2 we call one run. There is basically one uninterrupted period of data taking for which the conditions uh, should be stable, so it could be up to a few hours of running the detector. Uh, the REST interface really helps with decoupling uh, the server and the client side because uh, the interface is very simple, uh, very well defined, and since we split the metadata and the payloads, uh, we can also have intermediate steps. So when we start data processing, we just request the data, metadata from the server, and we get a payload info returned as JSON or XML, uh, which we can pass to know which files we need. <clears throat> then we can do whatever we want uh, locally, so we can check a local disk cache, or we can go to any number of technologies we want locally to find the files. And if we say, oh, we are missing some of those payload files uh, because they're not there yet, we can download those missing payloads again just using HTTP so that we can then finally start processing. And it also is uh, very helpful because it has very low requirements on the grid sites or any site you want to process because the only thing you need to actually have is connection to HTTP, and that is something which we have, uh, over the last decades, really, really gotten reliable. So there are two sides uh, to this talk. The first is the server side, which is exclusively 
or almost exclusively developed here at the PNNL. So the uh, current setup is that we have two separate services. There's one service for the uh, metadata, so the DB access, and one service uh, for the payload file download. Uh, so you can see those are separate services which uh, have a combined cluster file system. So one is uh, basically the REST API with a, a squid cache in front of it. And then we have a, a Papaya micro Java server which hosts the REST API and Hazelcast uh, for caching. And on the other side, it's really just a file server. So we have a, uh, a load balancer in front of a few Nginx HTTP servers which really just serve you the files. Those are almost separated <coughs> and work very well. And the, you can see the only part we base this part here, the REST API implementation itself, all the other parts are stock pieces which you can just take from open source. And each component is implemented as a Docker container and then we use Kubernetes to orchestrate all these setups uh, which gives us modularity and autoreach stuff. Uh, this has been already tested using Gatling, an uh, HTTP load stress tool uh, which has some scripting capabilities. And it's been sh uh, shown that the data server, database server performance is really dependent on the configuration. So you can do a lot of performance tuning just on the script in the Java, Java configuration, which of course shouldn't be any surprise. <coughs> While the payload server is, uh, as it's now with load balance, is already very stable, so there's basically nothing we have to do there. So if you look at the load balancing, the uh, REST API can sustain a request rate of about 80 requests per second. While for downloading files, we already can have 180 requests per second with uh, about 10,000 simultaneous users without problems. But still, so the current performance is about half of what we expect we need for uh, the full level of expected Bell 2 processing. So this is uh, already very good, especially considering that at the moment, these are all installed on a single PNNL managed host. So there's no federation for the REST API so far. This is really just one instance. <coughs> what we tell, are planning to do is, of course, to federate this out to have not one single point of failure, but to make more instances. And we're planning to use Hazelcast for this, which provides standalone caching to improve uh, the response time and the performance. And the data is evenly stored amongst the nodes automatically, so this gives you horizontal scaling for processing of storage. So the more nodes you add, it will just evenly distribute the cache. And also the backups distributed among the nodes, so if one of the nodes goes down, you don't care. You, you will not have single node failure, it will just uh, redistribute the backups. And each of the sites will have a so-called local cache, so the uh, requests you get locally will be preferred from a uh, local cache uh, for the commonly requested at the site, and it will not have to go to other nodes uh, for these. So this is now evaluated, uh, or will now be evaluated at PNNR. Uh, the sites should auto-cluster as they come online, and the cache distributed partitions uh, can be controlled across uh, each site, so each site can just say how much will I contribute, and they will just be auto-distributed in the cache. <coughs> this should all be transparent to the application, so Hazelcast manages the routing, and there's no code changes in our REST API application for this necessary. And then, of course, we will have a near cache, as I already said. Then there's one other point, which is a single point so far, is that we have a Postgres SQL server, that is not currently scalable, so at the moment we just have one of those servers. But of course, uh, there you can also think of newer things. So for example, we are investigating CockroachDB, which basically does something similar to Hazelcast. It will distribute uh, the database contents upon, uh, evenly across a set of nodes, so that even if one node goes down, or depending how you configure it, maybe two nodes go down, you will not have any interruption of the service and that you will have automated repair after failure. Uh, also, something we still have to do is that at the moment there's uh, currently no authentication implemented. What we foresee is that for read access, uh, this will just be open, so for the client side to just obtain the conditions data, there will not be any problem uh, to just get the data without authentication, but uh, we uh, plan to use a certificate uh, X.509 certificate authentication on the server side if you want to modify the database because this will just work very well together with the grid computing interface we already have. Thank you. 
Then from the client side, uh, the client side has been basically exclusively been done in, uh, in Germany. Uh, since we only have the REST interface, which we have to uh, talk about, this is uh, very simple to do. And also the client size, as you can imagine, is a bit simpler because we don't have to provide a full availability 24-7. It's just while the software is running, it needs to be reliable. So this is in our Bell 2 software framework, which is based on C++14 in root 6 and has Python 3 for configuration and scripting capabilities. And we also have multiprocessing using a, a multiple processes <coughs> support. And what we decided on the client side is that for each payloads, we will just use root files. So the payloads, are, which are files, uh, will be exactly in root format. So the users will uh, obtain reference to the payload by name. They will say, I need the payload of this name. And then the framework will obtain the payload information, look at a local cache and uh, download if necessary, update, uh, handle updates transparently. So the user will always just look at the correct uh, data at the given time. But if the user wants to be, can check or be notified if there are any updates. We also implemented a uh, operation without connectivity. So instead of just asking for the payload information from the data server, basically you just read it out from a text file and you don't have to have HTTP connection at all, assuming that you already have all the payloads available. And uh, we have a tool that allows you to automatically download uh, parts or the full database need be. So if you want to go on a flight and continue working on a laptop, you just call the tool to download the current status of the database and then use it from there. <coughs> uh, for the distribution of payloads, as I said, we have the HTTP download, which is hosted at PNNLL. But uh, this is not the necessary only solution. What we can have is an a lower cascade of payload information providers. So we could say uh, we look at the PNNL central database for the metadata and we look locally or we look even at a uh, different set of service and uh, one after the other and check which one is the first one which has information for us and we can do this to uh, help testing of new locally created payloads so you don't have to first upload them to the central server you just create your payload files locally. You put in a local database configuration and say use this folder in addition and then you can test everything before you upload it. <coughs> and also for the payload files themselves, you can just have a cascade of providers. So trivial caching, caching of course, in your local directory. But of course, you can uh, think of any distribution you want. So you can put in any of your favorite uh, technologies here either CVMFS key value stores like MongoDB or using Git pack files if you would be so inclined. So the, we foresee that uh, we have this flexible. So if a, a certain site says we have problems with our CVMFS scalability, could you please give us uh, an interface to this and this technology? This is no problem because this is co completely independent to the PNNL service, to the central service. We just need to be able to get a file with a certain name. And then we always have HTTP as a reliable folder. Uh, and then, of course, we also have a common line interface so they can easily handle this. And I just want to point out here that also this says if you work with HTTP, there is a million of very good libraries for you to work with. So if you haven't seen this before, I really suggest for if you use Python, you use a request library because then really just looping over all the lists of available payloads can be done completely in like fine five lines of code. So this allows us to, to give a very user-friendly conditions <coughs> database command line to, so that you, for example, can say, please show me differences between two tags. It will download the information and show you in a, a like git diff in a format what has changed between two different tags so that you can easily see ah, what are the problems, what changed in between. That brings me to the conclusions. So we have a <coughs> Bell 2 conditions database, which tries to leverage all the existing tools wherever possible. It's a REST state, a RESTful API, so an easy, well-defined interface, which is used uh, between client and server. The server is a payload content agnostic web service, so it provides the metadata and the files, but it doesn't need to know what's in the files using implemented using industry tools. And single server setup is already at half the expected needed performance and we're still in the process of federating this out to a more complex setup. And the client uses then by default root as file payloads uh, with automatic updates in an offline mode. 
and has an independent command line client implemented in Python, which makes life very easy for the user. And if you want to see more details on both of these, we have later two posters available. So I, I had a question about scale and whether I'm reading your, your graphs correctly. Um, I, I know when I look at the totality of the CMS conditions database accesses, that's all the caching of all the, the different layers. There's hundreds of thousands requests a second. Um, is, is that the scale you're, you're talking also at the leaves of the caches? I mean, I know your graphs show I, I, I'm guessing this is just the the, the, the origin server, not the... Uh, this not is just the, the origin server. So what, what, what hit rate are you planning for? Or for every know? process you start, there will be exactly one request to the database for getting the metadata, and this is this hit rate. So if you have 80 jobs running in parallel worldwide at the moment, or mm -hmm. starting per second, we are fine. Once the process is running, it will not talk to the database anymore. It's just at the beginning for installation, there's one request to get all the information, okay. and then only if there's something missing, we go for the file server, which can already handle a lot more. Okay, so the, the, the granularity of the request is very different between LHC versus... Yes, so basically okay. we have we have basically uh, the, the server only manages per one run, which can be a few hours of data taking. So if you have a process which spans multiple runs, for each run he will request once, but this it's usually only at the analysis stage where you don't need a lot of conditions data, just small. Uh, and um, if you need a condition which changes more frequently than this run, this is handled transparently on the client side. And there will be just more objects in the payload and he f switches them on demand. Okay, um, further comments or questions? Thank you. We can move on to the next talk.